Hello and welcome back to In Finite Space. We will be continuing where we left off, which if you recall is after Kalbik sort of opened up to Corwin when he was having a nightmare, or after he was having a nightmare I should say, and was then later given a bath. And then um, Corwin and his friends basically got their their pack, um, how they were going to be placed. And, of course, you know, they were all together, along with Brood. And now they all have to get along. You know, make nice. Play along nicely. And we also got to meet uh, Jay's Jazz, the pro-signed pro space raccoon boy with the Doc Ock arms. And, yeah, you basically going to be doing some zero-gravity training next. I wonder how that's gonna go. Ooh. Anyway, so without further ado, let us continue in finite space. I met with endless space. Staring into the void, bespeckled with stars, is unnerving. The fact that we have not all been sucked into the vacuum of space and also that my feet remain firmly on the floor is just enough to prevent myself from holding my breath. A few others, however, do just that. It's beautiful and inviting, in a standing-on-a-precipice kind of way. As I take in more, I look around the edges of the door where I can just make out the blurring of the holographic mesh. It breaks the illusion just a little. It's not just a complete void. Moving through the room are rocks in various sizes. Some are as large as houses. Others are smaller than myself. Damn. Looks like Brood may have guessed right. That smug prick. His tail wagging is enough to know that he's pleased at his assessment. I'm glad his back is to me. However, I can feel his grin through the back of his skull. Welcome to your playground, squires. Our instructor ascends from below the platform, all arms splayed like some giant spacefaring insectoid. The hands on their graft arms are creating small bursts that allow them to move gracefully until they come to Bob just in front and above us all. Fancy, isn't it? This area is called Rock Garden, but feel free to call him Rocky. You will be training here for the rest of the day. Jump in and get used to it. The atmosphere's fine. With a beckoning gesture and a backflip, Jess drifts off in a freefall, spiraling into the apparent open space. One by one, the squires ahead of me take the leap of faith and start floating freely. Some are already quite proficient with their maneuvering, staying in place or moving around one another. Others are far less graceful drifting, or in one case, rocketing off in odd directions. Jazz zips about, hurting them back into their packs. My turn comes after Zarya just leaps off and promptly shoots halfway across the room from an ill-timed arm activation. I look off the edge into the seemingly abyss of open space. A tingle of nervous excitement bubbles up in me, some parts of me saying not to jump, but a much more eager one yearns to leap into the unknown. I look up to locate Eryx, the furry meteor that he is, to use as a waypoint. Alex is floating nearby too. The two of them are up near one of the larger asteroids. Alex's tail band is glowing slightly. He seems to be interfacing some of his other adornments with the way that they twinkle. Focusing on them, I take a breath, raise one foot over the edge, and then leap off into space. The excitement that had been building continues to fill me as my body loses the anchor of gravity and I start drifting upwards towards them. I want to enjoy the moment, so I don't activate any of the suit's adjustments. I just take it all in. There is no up or down. Direction is meaningless, and the only rule is momentum. The urge to windmill my arms in an effort to control my movement is strong, but that would do nothing. There is a feeling of helplessness that rises up. It threatens to overwhelm me with fear. The sensation is not even close to anything that I've experienced. No, no, that's not entirely right. It's almost like floating on the lake. The memory comes unbitten. The hot summer sun blinks down, making me squint my eyes. The water supports me as I float on the immense surface. Deep depths below are just waiting to swallow me up. Haha, <laughs> what are you doing, Coral One? Floating about isn't going to net out. Do you want to just lie there, or are you going to come and help catch something? His voice is clear and full of laughter. It has been a while. I blink and focus on my packmates. 
I am adrift, lurching off target. No, I was gonna help. Thanks, Dad. Activating the emitters with my glove, I change my trajectory and fold my limbs in. I surge towards them with a single burst. As I approach them, I reach out and take their waiting extended arms. They help slow me as they use their own emitters to push back against my sudden speed. Who are there? We got you. How are you liking it? Yeah, it's something. I think I got it, but I can see how disorientating it can get. I look around at the other two squires. My brain tries to reconcile the chaos of space. Everything is askew, and no two squires are facing up the same way. Like a jigsaw put together incorrectly, my mind is trying to sort the disorder and organize the surroundings from my new Cartesian position. It is as exhilarating as it is migraine-inducing. Calbix certainly was right about the light breakfast. It makes me glad that our ascent caused some to bring theirs up in the vessel. Floating balls of puke would make the scene less than magical. Brute floats past us, inverted with his arms crossed. I am once again irritated by how smooth he looks. Though him being in the pack now means his aptitude is an advantage, right? Hmm. Well, speed certainly wasn't your priority, but at least you ended up with us, unlike the Wailing Comet. <sighs> there she is. On cue, Zarya is brought over by an ever so graceful Jazz, who doesn't even slow down after releasing her. Our Tigress careens into us, with Jazz ripping off to her at the last few orbiting squires back in. When our orange parcel hits three of us, we swirl as we compensate until, together, we're brought back to a standstill. By the time that we're brought her alongside us, Root has maneuvered around to face us too. Ha! Sorry, lads. Ooh, that was a rush. I've got the handle on it now, but I had to open the throttle and see what the upper limits are so that I can reel them in. She's beaming so much that I can't help but chuckle. The giddiness of her experience is still fresh. She grabs onto the rock next to us. Her arm glows purple as she secures herself to it. I do the same, although the suit emitters are far less powerful. I feel the pull of my arm towards the meteoroid, and I'm anchored. Right. Enough bobbing around like useless rotten apples. Time to start learning to soar and land correctly, like a thrown rotten apple hitting its mark, hopefully without the splatter. The analogy works. They circle around to face us all, albeit from an odd angle. Obviously, orientation is the name of the game when it comes to coordinating in three dimensions. I've been kind and made Rocky give you some rubble to use as a focus point. In actual space, you'll likely not be so lucky. Asteroid belts or planets with rings are not especially common. More often than not, there will be burning wreckage, the void of space, and maybe a planet somewhere in the distance. Without a frame of reference, it can be very easy to become disorientated and lost. I'm gonna be far too busy to fish around sectors looking for loose squires like dumplings and soups. Okay, maybe I skip the breakfast. Regardless, you have to first learn how to operate in directionless environments. With practice, and if I deem you worthy enough to mount my precious darling steeds, you will come to grips with this skill. Jazz floats over to the Ring of Rocks. With a flick of their various arms, they send out glowing beacons that dispense amongst the space, twinkling faintly. Propelling themselves back over to float above, they cross their arms and smirk down at us. Well, go on then. Let's see which pack can gather the most beacons and return to safety. They gesture towards the platforms that we leaped from. As all eyes return to the captain, they grin wildly and shoot up towards the ceiling. Huh? I said go. What are you all drifting there for? Go! There is a ripple of realization that travels through the group before a mad, weightless scramble begins. Jazz certainly knows how to sow chaos. There are squires who forgot their controls and flail, as well as some that jettison off and run in directions in their haste. I reach for my own controls before a paw clamps around my wrist. Brute gives me a pointed look, but quickly releases my arm. Remember the plan. Orientate. Coordinate. You stick with Spotty and take their relative's left side. To illustrate, he points at me and Alex before he sweeps his right paw over towards the side of the room. Shy guy, you watch stripes and keep her tethered. You have enough bulk to do that, at least. Take the relative right. Again, he waves over to the area that he expects Eric's and Zarya to deal with. Oi, watch it, Furball. You should at least learn the names of your packmates. And what will you be doing then? Zarya is bristling 
but I see that she is also eager to get started as the other squires are starting to head into the field. I'll play cleanup. I can move faster on my own. There were 70 to 80 beacons I saw Cap sent out, so let's aim for 5 each and then get back to the landing zone. 5 each would give us 25 in total. If he spotted the right amount, that was a large portion for one team to get. Before I can query, he shoots off in an arc towards the larger asteroids. He is remarkably graceful, almost beautiful, as he weaves and spirals past other squires. He even arrests a few of their momentum in what looks like a collision at first, but Brute just uses them to change his trajectory. It's infuriatingly smart. A tap on my left shoulder from Alex indicates that we should move to. I gave Erox and Zaria a thumbs up, and not before we depart to our assigned areas. I follow Alex closely, close enough that his tail sometimes bumps my head or one of my shoulders. I think he is going slow on my account. Ahead, there are a group of squires jostling one another for a found beacon. Alex chooses to move around them in a wide berth and push ahead. I keep pace and scour for any glowing points to zero in on around us. I scan the rocks as they move in spiral and also watch the other squires. Some fly around and others hop between large boulders. Wait. There. I spot a glimmer below between two smaller rocks. Bodies caught in a gravitational spiral around one another. I tap Alex's foot and then point when he looks back. Well done. Give me a boost. Feet to feet. I'm not sure what he means at first, as he motions down slightly and tucks in his knees. Feet flat out. I get what he wants. Flipping over, I line up and place my feet to his, and then secure a magnetic lock to him. I have this image that I resemble a performer balancing atop a furry ball. I look past him to where our target is. He cranes his neck and keeps track of it too. Wait for it. Now! In tandem, he kicks out and pushes off of me as I command the emitters to go full on, sending him surging like a missile. As I slam on the emitters on the opposite direction to stop me from careening off further, I keep my eyes clued to Alex. He tucks in his extremities, his tail trailing behind him like a party streamer. There is another squire closing in on our chosen beacon. Upon seeing Alex fast approaching, they decide to swim out of the way in an amusingly frantic display. Alex decelerates at the last moment, spreading himself like a parachute before grabbing the glowing point. He grasps at one of the meteoroids nearby, using its rotation to turn. He centers himself before looking towards me. Damn, are all these guys ballerinas or something? I don't have time to admire him heading back as I hear the sound of impact and scramble from above. There is a large rock close by. It seems like someone is trying to move over its surface. As it rotates, I see two grappled squires trying to outmaneuver each other. A glowing beacon sits on the ground, not in arms reach away from them. As they grunt and struggle, they both freeze as they spot me. I slowly reach up as they stare and pluck the beacon from the surface, quickly retreating my arm as they both continue to rotate back out of view. I hear twin groans of disappointment and realization. Not the most valiant victory, but sometimes you have to take the win. I affix the beacon to my gear just as Alex floats up beside me, giving me a gentle and intended bump. Saw that. Their faces. He grins at me, his own prize also safely secure. We don't linger on the fielding. Alex immediately chooses a vector, and then we re realign the same way before heading off again. This feels amazing. Scary and still a little disorientating, but truly a feeling that I can get used to. The more we move, the more I find myself adjusting to the concept of moving through a constantly changing environment and heading. A tickle of excitement in the back of my mind starts to grow. From training, I know that cavalry knights that excel most are those that grasp spatial directions fast and confidently. I have to remind myself that what we are doing now is nothing compared to the microsecond to microsecond changes needed to fight an actual plague fleet. Considering I started today as a beginner, not feeling totally lost fills me up with a spark of confidence. As we head into a denser part of the field, maneuvering becomes harder. Alex shows me some pretty interesting moves, mostly on avoiding collisions. He also uses any terrain that we are coming close to, changing trajectory whenever he or I spot a new beacon. This is what Brute was talking about, and it's an invaluable lesson. Alex manages to get two more beacons unimpeded, and I snag one more before we come across other squires aiming for a beacon that we're lining up for. Just as I am closing in on what will be my third, a beacon lodged deep in a crevice on a locker-sized meteoroid, Alex shouts, Watch it! 
It's just enough time for me to see a chunk of rock hurtling towards my target and slam into reverse. I reach for Alex's outstretched arm and, with his help, get out of the area. The rocks collide with a crunch and then break apart. Above us, relatively, I can see two squires. I recognize one as Squire Ludge, who I shot with yesterday. The other, a uh, Crocodilidean, is grinning as they knock another rock down at us with their tail, trying to make us move. We must retreat. There. Uh, we can take cover behind the meteoroid. On my mark. Ready? I see where he's pointing, and then I scan quickly to see where the others are. Ludge is lining up to push off the huge rock that he's latched onto and dive to the beacon, which I managed to spot in the debris. It's not too far from us now, but if we retreat, we'll surely lose it. I don't want that. No, Alex. I can still get it. Slingshot me. I reach out to him. Alex looks torn between his choice and mine. Seeing the second rock approaching, he grabs me and starts to rotate. Do not blame me if you get smeared, Corwin. But here, we go! As we rotate, we both boost our emitters to speed up. I'll either get this right, overshoot, or collide with Ludge, the rock, or something else, none of which is a good result. We rotate one final time before the projectile reaches us. Alex lets go. He's timed it great as I soar towards the blinking moat below. Looking back, Alex had enough excess momentum to avoid being hit too. The debris is small, but spreads wide, and I have very little time to adjust my approach. Left, right, in Arleon roll, around some others, my eyes never leave my shimmering target, and my peripheral vision, Ludge, is closing the gap. The seal looks at home swimming, towards the beacon at high speeds, but my acceleration is greater and I'm overtaking him. It's going to be close, and I see him reaching out forward. After missing the last piece of rock between me and the prize, I extend my arms. We collide at the last second, and each of us spiraling away erratically, my right arm stings. I try to activate the emitters in sequence to arrest my spin, though it's hard to judge. It takes me a moment to slow to a stop. I'm glad that it was Ludge rather than the croc that I hit. Ludge's softness helped lessen the blow, and it's only my ears that are left ringing. Glancing about, I spot him. He's still spiraling. I think he's trying to figure out how to stop. Enough of him, though. Where's the beacon? I scan about the debris. Enough of him, though. Where's the beacon? I scan about where the debris is still dispersing. I don't see it. Did the croc grab it after we collided? I clench my hands angrily. My right hand doesn't ball up fully. Looking down, I see a meek blinking emanating from it. Oh, I must have grabbed it before we impacted. Oh! I look about and see Alex moving over to me as I wave at him, victoriously. His concerned expression gives way to a laugh as he pulls up alongside my left side. Well done. Are you alright? Looks like quite the hit. His paw grazes my sides and probes gently, feeling for lasting injuries. All he ends up doing is tickling me, and I can feel heat creeping across my face. N no. I I'm good, Alex. Really. <clears throat> you can stop. He looks at me and then removes his paws hastily, looking away as well. There is the briefest of moment when we just drift, inches apart, silently. The moment is soon broken by the nearby whoops of other squires claiming a prize. We instantly resume scanning for more. There! We manage to secure the next few beacons without issue, though the number available is definitely dwindling in our section. Alex suggests that we head to the platform and snag any remaining ones on the way back. As we propel ourselves towards a landing point, I spot Brute. He's leaping and soaring from rock to empty space to the next meteoroid. It's a form of zero-gravity parkour that is truly amazing to watch. He dives between a bunch of other squires, scooping up a beacon, and doesn't stop. He just moves on like it was nothing. I'm so entranced that I almost miss Alex grabbing my arm and pointing. Following his right arm, I see he's gesturing to a scuffle between three squires who appear to have found two unclaimed beacons on a larger, flatter boulder. A stocky bovine is grappling with the other two and holding his own pretty well, but that also means that he is unable to make a move to grab the prize for himself. A back to back, then full swing in. I'll swing you around at the last moment, and we'll swipe both in a flyby, okay? It sounds like a solid plan, and I trust them. I nod. Moving around and linking our arms to the elbows, we press our backs together and look at the target. During this whole exercise, I've been getting a lot of dir direct contact with Alex. I fully appreciate how built he is. 
his back against mine, is taunt and ready. I line up my feet to his, our legs against one another's, and then start the emitters, pushing them to the max. Alex controls a finer alignment, changes. All he needs from me is to give him full throttle. We surge towards the scrappling trio. Even while focusing on the target, I want to keep an eye on their situation. The bull is using his horns to great effect as he lifts and flings his smaller opponent. They yelp as they cartwheel away. One on one, I'm sure that he'll make short work of the remaining squire, so we only have a moment to try this. Alex is holding his arms tighter as we close in. At our current speed, we will surely crash into the rock, but I'm certain that he knows what he's doing. Just as we get to the moment where deceleration would be pointless, Alex makes his move. Unlinking arms, he lets me pull ahead of him while he changes his stance and thrusts. His paw clamps onto my ankle, and then he yanks. My momentum is directed, and we start to swing away. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the bull squire charging us now that his opponents are dealt with. However, my eyes stay locked on the two points of light, sweeping to meet me as my head comes dangerously close to the rock's surface. I can feel the strain from Alex's grip as he is pulling us in the new tangent, away from collision. I reach out with both hands even as the thundering hooves of one determined bullvine echo ever closer towards me. My gloved hands scrape against the hard surface as I rake them over the beacons, fisting them as tightly as I can as my swing starts to be pulled away and free. I come within inches of the poor bull, who looks both frustrated and in awe. Sorry. I mutter out my apology before we're gone, accelerating away, though not cleanly. We spiral slightly from the awkward grip Alex has me on. Got them? Got them! Great. Help me stop, please. It takes us a bit of time to mitigate our movement and come to a standstill. Eventually we do, Alex still holding me as we rotate a fraction to face the landing point. We did well. You did well, Corwin. Picking up movement like this is not easy at the best of times. Jazz might be right about the trial by fire approach, but still, kudos. He grins at me, which I return. His praise means a lot, especially given his grace and speed. Yeah, we make a good team. We should hurry back, though. Time is a factor as well. I say it as much to prompt myself as Alex. Being held so close while floating and after such a rush of endorphins from victory could easily lead to things cropping up. With a nod, Alex releases me, and then we both make our way back to the platform. There are a few packs already back, sitting or relaxing. From the looks of it, not everyone has stomached the activity particularly well. A few squires also have some med strips on them, likely bruising from collisions or scuffles. Zarya as if the edge, waving at us excitedly as we approach. Eryx looks on as well, perked up as he spots us too. I reach for Zarya's outstretched arms. She pulls me in and helps me until my feet connect to the platform. Alex lands himself, still gracefully and daintily. Hey, welcome back, Packmate. I thought that we lost you both. How'd you do? Her fur along her left cheek is slightly wet, and her nose appears to have been bleeding, but she still exudes happy energy. I guess whatever happened, she isn't bothered by it. I pass Alex one of the final beacons. We snacked and then retrieved the others that I had stored. I got my quota, and Alex ended up with six. Overall, a great result. Zarya whistles partially from her mouth and partially from her nose. Is it busted? Woo wee! That's fantastic! I only managed to get four though. Eric's got all five. It's even more remarkable since he spent time reeling me in. She grabs Eric's in a sideways hug and ruffles his fur. He shrinks away, but grins sheepishly back at her. You wouldn't be just excited. I wouldn't have gotten as many if you weren't scary. I mean, if you weren't dragging so much focus. She just laughs at him as Alex goes into details over the various victories. I scan the field again for our missing member. There are still a fair few packs going at it. The competition is growing frantic over the last few remaining beacons. As my eyes try to pick him out, I eventually spot Brute. He's in the middle of the four-way contest. The asteroid that are on slowly rotates them into view. I squint to make out what's going on, but they are a bit too far and moving too fast to really see who is doing what. That being said, seeing Brute fending them off on a rotating rock in the middle of a weightless environment is impressive. Especially as I see one squire being picked up and thrown into the void by the belligerent wolf. He must be victorious, as I soon see him leaping off and surging back, doing the odd leaping and parkouring style movements that I'd seen before. Very effective, if unorthodox. He lands with his feet 
knees down, taking most of the acceleration off at the last moment. He pants for a minute before standing and taking slower, deeper breaths. Done. Fuck those losers for trying to slow me down. He sneers at the distant enemies of his who are still searching. Competitive really doesn't begin to describe Brute. I'm coming to realize he always wants to win. He turns back to focus on us, his eyes scrutinizing. So, how many? Ah, yes. He was including us in his conditions for victory. Rather than giving a breakdown, I decided to just give him the good news. 20 in total. Everyone did their part. Don't worry. I thought that he was going to be snide, but he just grins and pulls out his horde of glowing lights. Four, five, six. Yeah, read him and weep. Eight. Hmm. There is no way any other pack got more than 28. We fucking beat them. Yes. This is the first time that I've ever seen him actually smile. He looks quite nice when he isn't scowling or sneering. If it wasn't for the things that he says, I could almost begin to tolerate him. The collected turn at the sound of the whistle. The captain peeps in a few more times as they soar through the room, herding the remaining squires back to us. After the last squire touches down, Jazz addresses us with the biggest smirk. <laughs> there we go. Isn't it better to get limbs on and get a feel for it rather than a lecture on the theory? I spotted some absolute beautiful maneuvers out there and some utter shit ones, but the laugh was worth it. They chuckle as they scan the crowd with their STIK. The beacons in our grasp pulse in response. As Jazz comes to land, their graft arms fold back in. They look much less like an arachnoid, though still intimidating as they paw through the data on the hollow screen. Oh! They whip their head around, finding Eric's. Then they quickly scan over the rest of our pack one by one with a sadistic grin. My, my! You trying to make me proud or something, my squire? Look at this! Jazz slaps the hollow screen and makes it bigger for everyone to see. The table shows a list of us, by pack and the total beacons obtained. Ma is at the top. By quite a margin, the next highest pack total was only 17. 40% of the total. Uh-huh. Yes, yes. We'd love to see that. Good job, Ma. That is how you trounce the competition, all right. Hmm. We'll have to see if in the next session the rest of you can outdo them. Painted a nice target on yourselves with that, Ma. I swear they said that to get the others fired up against us. Great. Now we'll have to perform just as well with the other packs after us. Now... I'm not going to stand here and tell you all what you did right or wrong. Self-reflection does a better job for now. Think over how you performed and how you'll be doing things differently. You have the luxury of that now, so use it. I'll upload the feed of the exercise to you all so that you can examine yourselves from an outsider's perspective as well. They flick their SDIK towards us, and I feel the vibration and ping from my own in response. Tomorrow we will engage in a more defined training regimen. I expect to see you all bright and early. For today, however, you're all dismissed. Go explore and shit. Except you, you, and you. They gesture at a few of the squires who have been laying down when Alex and I returned. You added some very nonsensical biomaterial to my garden, and you are going to help clean it up. Rocky does not need any donations from you lot clogging up his ports. So lucky you. More floating for you. The address squires look admonished and trudge over to the captain. The rest of us start to make our way to the exit. Oh, I have sent the location of your rooms as well, and the promised credits, so you can have a good time on Belva's. But... If I catch even a single squire reporting hungover tomorrow, I'll make it look like these lots have gotten off easy. You hear? Yes, Captain. Good. Now shoot. Gotta look after my poor besmirched baby now. With that, the rest of us hurry out before we get roped in to clean as well. After we found the cabin lodgings and the unhappy realization that I am bulking with Brute, we start our stuff and change into casual dress. I was rather alarmed and excited seeing the credit allowance that we've been given. It doesn't take me long to wash and change. Brute decides that making sure his belongings are secure and his bunk is properly set up takes priority. I lean out over the walkway and glance out the scenery below, as I wait for the others. The streets are active with folks coming off their shift, even being this far above the tantalizing smell of street vendors and restaurants starting up from the evenings makes me salivate. 
there are walkways that crisscross so much, looking down conscious the image of a spider web. I shudder at the memory of Captain Jazz floating about and shake my head in an effort to dissipate the mental image. Some ancient human dance. Alex chuckles as he slides out his cabin and then leans on the railing next to me. He gives me that smile that shows more in his eyes than his mouth. My attention is drawn immediately to his attire. It looks immaculate. I can't read the scripture stitch across it, but it looks good on him regardless. I also take note of a few accessories adorning him. I wonder how much it is for show and how much is actually functional in some manner. No dance that I know of. Should I patent it as my own? Think that it could catch on? Alex chuckles. It is nice to see him back to being himself, rather than being caught up in yesterday's incident. Ah, uh, who can say? I was only ever taught traditional dances. Yours seem too abstract for this humble cat to be able to judge. Maybe some far, far away place may adopt it as their new ballroom waltz. Oh, but Lord Thronos, we already danced earlier today in the garden, did we not? I think that I could teach you more abstract positions in, but a few lessons. I give him a mock bow, and just as I'm about to see an opening, his mouth to retort, Zarya classically bursts forth from her door and interjects. What's this I hear? We going dancing? Appearing the epitome of comfortable casual, Zarya gives us a look that makes me think that she's serious about dancing. Not that if we don't want the locals to flee in panic at the sight of Corwin. He is unfortunate in the coordination department. I spin to glare at him as he winks at me. Hey, I was taught a few proper dances. You name a time and place, and we'll throw down. Now that does sound like fun. I'll happily join in. I want to see how your dances differ from my clans. We mostly dance ceremoniously or for big celebrations. <laughs> Dancing? Eric squeaks as he exits his and Alex's room. He has a full flight or fight look on his face and is even reaching back for the door. No, no, uh, calm yourself, Eric. We were just joking about something Corwin was doing. We weren't actually planning on going dancing. Not that there would be any contest. He gives me another smirk with the last comment and I narrow my eyes at him. Maybe having Alex back to being coy isn't better after all. Jeez, the fuck are you all clucking about? I could hear you through solid metal. Brute finally graces us with his presence, knocking on the paneling to emphasize his irritation. His casual look is more of a mismatch of items, but it kind of works for him. They look well-worn too, though clearly cared for. He glances us over, his muzzle only noticeably wrinkling at Alex. His look softens just a little when his eyes linger on me. It's called polite conversation, Brute. You should try it. Zarya rolls her eyes at Brute before looking down into the city streets, her expression quickly changing to eagerness. She squints at shops and signs. What should we do then? We have credits to burn and plenty of time to explore. After all that acrobatic circus tricks, I'm famished. Her nose twitches as she inhales a sense wafting up. I'd like to check out a few of the stores and see what kind of products they have up here. Um, I'm not confused about shopping. If if we can perhaps pass by some of the city system nodes, I will be, I will be most grateful. She has mentioned a few of the ways they pull this place for long-term deployment, and I would like to have a look, if that isn't too much of a bother. Alex smiles kindly at Eryx as he squeaks out his request. Of course, Eryx, we're a team as well as friends. We'll be more than happy to do what you want as well, wouldn't? He glares over at Brute, who crosses his arms and scowls back. We? Brute? Brute looks like he's about to bite back for a moment. Instead, surprisingly, he huffs and looks away. <sighs> Aspersions. Huh? He scowls a little before repeating himself. Aspersions. There is a branch store here. I'd like to look at what they have. If I have to follow you around doing pointless things, I'd like to at least see if there are any advanced tech worth my time on sale. Zarya looks like she's about to interject, but Alex holds up a paw. I guess that I'd be half a hypocrite if I said that we would not do what one of the pack wanted. Fine then, Brute. We will make our way down, check some of the areas for Eryx, peruse the stores, and then finish with a meal. Does this sound good? With tensions more or less diffused, we nod in agreement, and then the pack moves into the city. 
we spend the next few hours wandering the streets of Belvos doing what we plan. I'll admit that I haven't nearly as much interest in the construction of the city as Eric's, but the parts and structures that he stops to look at must be important. Look, Corwin, these pillars use the same heavy-based kinetic bombardment system that the dropships have for emergency for failure. It is scary, but cool. The way that he examines them, takes notes, and captures images of them reminds me of the fanatical excitement Maros showed when talking about tech. His stumpy tail wagging up a storm is well worth the detour. The stores are the bigger draw for me. With a generous credit dump from Captain Jazz, I feel the burning desire to buy something for myself, namely some new clothes. The high-end boutiques are a little overwhelming, though. Alex gives him a cursory look, but he does agree that the more functional clothing in a store called Designer Debris would be better, and may even reveal some hidden bargain. As Zarya and Alex get into a heated debate over the hierarchy of importance between aesthetics and practicality, I comb through some of the racks looking for something I want. There is a lot of variety in the garments, as well as the sizes. Some are made of reshapable mesh that can adjust to a few body types, and some others are species-specific. I don't have any issues wearing something tailored for other species, as long as the clothing doesn't have additional appendage holes, or unique materials that are designed for fur or scale types that would irritate my skin. I end up finding a rather nice jacket. It has blue accents on the breast and sleeves. While still looking durable, price is still a tad steep. It would be nice to have something that matches Calvix's attire. The blue is the same shade as his eyes, which is what attracted me to it. As I consider it, I'm surprised when Brute's paw appears from left suddenly. He rubs the fabric between his pads before running a claw along it. Was he after it as well? He checks the Maker's brand and the price tag before releasing it. Maker is good, and it's one of the durable lines, but a few seasons old now. It's worth it as it is, but ask them to knock 10% off. It'll last you a long time if you care for it. With that remark, he just walks off to another rat. Truly, he is a vexing as he is unpredictable. I'm not sure what he is playing at, but I do take the jacket to the counter. They check the system after I mentioned a lower price, and they agree that it is an old enough product to warrant it. More than satisfied, I put it on to wear out. After comparing a few of the items to the others picked out, we move on. Asperion's turns out to be packed, and it is clear to see why. The store has all manner of unusual and new tech from... Er... Er... Silkar? The... Pro Sinoid home planet is touted as the most advanced technologically speaking in the galaxy. Rumors are that they even converted the entire planet into machinery, though the idea beggars belief. The salespersons are very animated and draw passers-by into the store with their own over-the-top spiel. As I linger to watch the demonstration of obsoleting shields matrix, Brood enters, but the time the presentation is done, he has finished up and is leaving. He must have already known what he wanted to buy, or was just very efficient with his shopping. Even if he looks pleased, I am not about to pry into what he's bought. If he thinks that I've shown interest, he may spend hours securing them in the room later. I do not want to endure that. By the time we hit the food strip, my stomach is rumbling up a storm. Ooh, look, look, there's a zero gravity grill, and there's spots in the front of the chef. Let's eat there. Our excited tigress points at one of the open-style restaurants where the chef cooks right in front of you. I've never eaten in one before, but it looks great. Mm, I can stay from here. I mean, if everyone else wants to. Eric's mouth is practically watering with a chuckle, Alex nods, and then we all clamber up onto the high stools. After looking over the menu and ordering a set meal, we each make our choices and then watch the chef get to work. The preparation is just as much about being showy as it is about cooking the food. The chef uses various tools and fields to suspend the ingredients in the air, with plasmid rings and swirling spices in such an array that it looks like a circus of food. Meat soars through the obstacle course being seasoned, cooked, and pulled through sauce like the chef is a conductor. We applaud when they finally present us with our bowls of spectacularly prepared cuisine. Now that was something. Alex looks delighted with this expertly sliced the meat and accompaniments, and takes a taste. Mmm, and I am happy to see the display is only matched by the flavor. This day truly has offered plenty of new experiences. I have not seen such a place before. He chews happily. I take a taste myself, having gone for an all-in one bowl set with a sphere of soup as well. 
The soup is suspended above a small emitter. With a straw, it is easily slurped down. In between bites from the bowl, it is paired incredibly well. The broth cuts through the fatty meat with a refreshing amount of spice. Even Brute has put away his scalp for a moment, giving his forehead a well-earned rest as he chows down on his meat-rich choice. Ooh, this is so good! I have never had anything this glorious before! Wow! Her tail bounces and wiggles in utter delight and satisfaction. I can't help but grin as she chokes on her far too large bite, and she then slams a fist into her chest to help clear it. <coughs> I'm okay. <coughs> I'm okay. Your eagerness is surely a compliment to the chef, but perhaps a little less haste would be prudent. You're telling us you truly have never had such a meal. The ingredients and performance aside, cooking technique is not overly complicated. Zarya looks sheepish as she takes a few sips of her beverage. Then, she takes another bite. She chews slowly and savors it thoughtfully. Hmm. Well, my people have a philosophy of trying to keep and honor the original form of all things as closely as possible. From buildings to weapons to food. She finishes with a nod to her meal. She carefully picks apart the pieces into small piles. We traditionally will eat food with very little processing, raw, slightly seasoned, if at all, or sometimes seared just a little. Each ingredient is its own treasured mouthful. She mixes the separated food back together, rebelliously, and then scarfs down the result with glee. Some things are better together though, don't you think? Hmm? Eryx is leaning forward on a stool, listening intently. His meal alone would probably be an affront to Zarya's clansmen, with each mix of ingredients from the land, sea, and sky. I... I almost have the idea behind this dance, but, but, but cooking should be something to experiment with. I feel at least. There are so many combinations to be had. I love tasting new flavors. Um, sorry if that was rude. Rude huffs at the end of the line. There his scowl is back in place. Sounds like the ideals of those with more time on their plate than sense. Hey, that's rude. I mean, I do think that that's somewhat archaic, and my clan is more traditional than most. However, the principle of admiring the effort it takes to get food from the source to a meal does make sense, I think. Principles are a luxury the starving can't afford when all they can scrounge up is a half-flattened box of barely edible processed gunk, and have no idea what or when they'll eat next. He digs back into his meal as Zarya stares, clearly at a loss for words. Ah. Well, I do. Yes. Of course. When it comes to survival and... I mean, before the plague, that is. She mumbles off and goes back to her meal. I fear that we will all eat in silence now, but Alex strips up. I do understand what you mean, Brute. Ideology. Standards. Etiquette. It all is good and done when you aren't being beset by an unpredictable, ever-consuming threat. So much has been disrupted and lost. I admire the Tigris culture for trying to hold onto some of the heritage that they're proud of without falling into denial and stubbornness over it. After all, those arms aren't basic at all. Zarya looks up at that and then flexes her claws, the motors gently working as each digit moves. They are truly a mechanical marvel. I mean, yeah, of course. We had to change. We had to adapt. All of us had to. The crown system hasn't been hit yet, but some of the outer colonies that were reaped, plenty of convoys too, more so before KAU took the flight back to them. My system was targeted at the turn of the century. Being so mineral rich, we have always been on high alert. Fortunately, a KAU contingent was in the sector. They didn't get to deploy planetside before they retreated. Alex shakes his head in a sad dismay his tail twitching irritably as he continues. Since then, it's been a game of hunter and hunted, small incursions, distractions, and fence. Infrequent strikes and then coordinated pincer attacks, KAU has had to occupy two moons in the system to keep up a consistent presence. Eric stares at Alex with what appears to be a newfound respect. There had been lessons on which systems the plague seemed most keen on hitting repeatedly, but I hadn't put the connection together that Alex was from one of them. That's so... insane. I can't imagine what your people must go through on a daily basis. Just wondering what the next attempt is gonna be. Just waiting for the green storm to... to... He peters out, 
I winced when he mentioned the storm. He'd noticed. In fact, they all have and are looking at me expectingly. You don't have to... No. No, it's okay. Alex, I... I should share this. Everyone else is sharing their experiences, and we are a pack. We should connect as much as we can. Still, it feels like reopening a wound that was barely started to scab over. My system. My planet was attacked when I was a kid. Not even a teen. We'd never been the target before. They just appeared one day and started tearing the world apart. They told us afterwards that emergency buoys had been deployed right away, but we were so far out from anything. Even with quantum messaging, it took a while for the fleet to arrive. I rubbed my hands together as I recall it, the sound of panic, the rumbling of the earth beneath us as it cracked and split, the hopeful feeling when it was announced that the cavalry had arrived and engaged. The green storm came in the morning. My, my mother and I were heading to a KU extraction point. We didn't know who was winning, just that the cavalry was fighting them. It, it was, there was panic, people screaming, trampling over one another to try and get to safety. I lo my voice breaks and I cough. I've been keeping my eyes down as I recount the attack, but as I reach for my glass, I see their faces. Horror, fear, pity, even brute looks solemn. I take a sip to clear my throat and then keep pushing through. I lost her. My mother. One moment I had her hand, the next, gone. I could hear her calling me, but with everyone pushing and shoving, I ended up in an alley. Maybe I could have found her eventually, but the plague ships started falling. Something had happened in the battle and the stray ships started impacting the city. The noises of those impacts, like detonations. The vibrations through the ground and air. The screams. All of it's so clear even now. It rings in my ears. When the dust settled, there was next to nothing left. Or no one left. I met Maros, my best friend back home, digging through the rubble. We didn't know what had happened and what to do, so we just stuck together. It took even KAU days to get through all the wreckage to find every survivor. We were weak by the end from hunger, so I don't recall much of it. But I remember the armor and the figure of the knight who pulled us out of the makeshift camp that we put together. I shrug. It truly was a blur. The hours and the days that followed blended together before we both ended up in the shelter on the moon. I probably still would have joined KAU before all that. After? It felt like I owed it to everyone to try to get justice, to make what happened not happen anymore. Well, eventually. Once we beat them. Damn, Corwin. I had no idea. I'm sorry. I concur. I have lived through that. I cannot imagine the fortitude that must have taken. I didn't mean to bring down the mood. It's times like this that having Brute to be his usual snide self might actually help. But even he is looking away at the street. Well, I think you could have bit in terms of uh, first kind experience. We can go up to the rooms if you like. We all jump with the grill, hisses as the chef throws the next course down on the hot nettle, flipping it slowly through the orbiting spices. They start their next performance. Eric's is so startled that he teeters back on a stool. Zaria has to grab him to prevent him from tipping over. It is alarming, but the interruption broke the tension, which I am glad for. Whoa, Eric's! Careful! We still need you for tomorrow. I wonder what your knight is even going to make us do. Do you have any idea? Oh, uh, thanks, Saria. Um, uh, I don't know. Jias is very focused and intelligent, but also kind of wild. So, I don't know what they will have us doing. Maybe escape or jettison procedures, or rapid decompression, or... But the moment passed, the meal continues as we discuss what to expect from the feisty captain tomorrow. I'm still stressed, but it eases as the night progresses until we eventually all head to our cabins. As I somewhat expected, Brute takes his time going through all of his purchases in a secretive manner on his top bunk. I leave him to it as I wash up and get ready for bed. If I wasn't so exhausted, I'd be worried that Brute was going to try something while I slept, 
Well, everything that has happened today, I am ready to just turn in and can't care less about the wolf. By the time that I come out of the washroom, Brute has already stowed everything and got into his bunk properly. I guess he is a morning shower kind of guy. I slide into and settle in. The bed isn't as comfy as the one that I am getting so used to at Kalbex's house, but it is still very well made, if more utilitarian. I try to wind down listening to the odd hum and thrum of the station city around us. Brute is also shifting above me. It makes me remember the dorms, with as many as ten of us to a room. When you learn to sleep through that, you can sleep through any amount of noise. I start to drift off as I hear a voice calling from above. Did all of that really happen to you? The storm and everything? It's low and barely a whisper. I feel the need to reply in kind. Yeah. Yeah, it was all true. I wait for him to reply. After a moment of silence, I hear him roll over and make himself comfortable. I guess he doesn't want to say anything else. Good night, brood. I mutter before closing my eyes and trying to drift off again. Night, Corwin. In the morning, Brute seems just as grouchy as ever. He rises and then gets ready, keeping the bathroom door open the whole time. Deciding that I'd rather leave him be, I get dressed and then step out to look over the railing again. The streets below are active again, though with more of a morning rush feel to them. I'm not aching much from yesterday, so I'm eager to take on whatever Jazz decides to throw at us. Just as I'm anticipating more fantastical gravity-defying maneuvers, a blaring announcement rips to the station. Many of the building faces and screens change to display an alert. Plague incursion from OSID Sector, C-45, X-405-6, engagement complete, alert, plague incursion status, retreated, ongoing threat level high, plague presence and auxiliary attacks expected, all stations to commit to continual scans, all operations to be battle and deployment ready, casualties, Raptor Unit, Pax, Beak, Wingtip, and Talon, OOC pending medical screening, end of alert. I stare at the alert scrolling across the screens. The plague. They've attacked. Those sector coordinates. No. Not near Foro. They are at least a dozen systems away. Still, three packs have suffered some injuries. No announced deaths. But would they even? Out of commission could mean anything from mild to severe. I hope that the pending medical part means that everyone has survived. The details are so vague. I don't know how many plagues were even involved. The doors open behind me and my packmates rush out, wide-eyed. The rooms behind them are awash with a glow from the same alert. My STIK vibrates and whistles with a notification. The others get one too. We hurry to pull them out to see the same message blaring around us, but with a few more details. Plague incursion from Alsid Sector C45-X405-6. Operational update. Alert. Plague incursion status retreated. Ongoing threat level high. Incursion type reaping. Plague core ship forced to retreat. Planetary damage less than 15%. Bishop division deployed. Plague presence and auxiliary attacks expected. Archer division requested in the system. All the to be battle and deployment ready. Casualties, Raptor unit, Pax, Beak, Wingtip, and Talon. OOC pending medical screening. Operational changes. Lunar Unit Packs, Maw, Claw, Hide, Approved, or Active Duty. I stare at the last line. Our pack is active. The next alarm could call us to the front lines, to fight the plague. I am not the only one in shock. Everyone else is reacting to the realization. Are we really ready? Am I? And that was... Is this centered wrong? Hmm. <laughs> Little something you guys might have to fix. <laughs> Anyways, but that was... Well, the current update for... In Finite Space. So... The group has been paired into packs. Uh, well, first, um, thank you for Bear for, you know, contributing your voice yet again. You always knock it out the park. 
Anyways, um, uh, also, um, originally he was only gonna voice um, the bear, you know, bear voicing a bear, but then I was like, yeah, you know what? You could have also voiced Calbix because you know you have the voice for it. Uh, and then it turns out that the bear doesn't have that many lines in this update. <laughs> anyway, so that always happens. Anyways, um, so yeah, uh, everyone has been paired. And I mean, I guess it was sort of like fortuitous that Calbix and his knights were also doing like their little um, routines in order to be able to properly work with the new people. So, of course, the squires were also going to be paired with their new um, pack mates. I guess that's what they're called. And I mean, obviously, um, Corwin was going to be paired with the people he already knows because then, you know, you would have to make more sprites. <laughs> um, but also, like, it's fostering this com camaraderie between these guys. Well, between these people. Um, and also it's allowing us to, I guess, have Brute be a bit more expanded instead of just being like the antagonistic wolf. He, uh, there's, there's clearly more to him than meets the eye. So he's not all bad. He just needs to be able to learn how to play nice with other people. And perhaps learning more about his past um will help but he has to be open enough to be able to reveal his past so that these guys and gals are able to better understand him anywho so it's exciting now that the group is probably going to have to be deployed to fight the plague and that also kind of means that we may be able to see what the plague looks like because right now it's sort of like this abstract um, uh, menace. Like, yeah, it, it's kind of bug-like. And it kind of gives me Starship Trooper vibes in a way. Like, the story kind of gives me Starship Trooper vibes. More so in how the first um, night that they were being trained by was kind of making it seem like, yeah, you guys are here to basically help us uh, you're you're basically um, uh, cannon fodder. You're you're bullet sponges. You're you're here to absorb a lot of the pain that we're gonna have to deal with, so that we can do our job. And don't really care much about you unless you like you somehow make night or survive or whatever. You're you're expendable. Basically, he was making it seem like that. But also, there is no real reason given right now as to why the plague is plaguing um uh also why these i think it's mostly canine why they decided to take it upon themselves to fight this plague and why they decided to also just scoop up um races from around the galaxy or universe or whatever it is i, I think it's just galaxy um and like train them to become knights and also squires so that they can go on to this war with the plague. Like, could it be one of those things where it's like, oh, um, we're fighting this war with this, like, this evil space insect race, but like, you know, turns out that it was kind of our fault to begin with, but we're not going to say that it's our fault, you know? <laughs> you know, because then that's going to make us look bad. It could be it kind of like Hell Divers too, if you haven't played it. You know, where the bugs, the automatons, they're they're kind of all, you know, from things that Super Earth was doing. Oh no, somebody's gonna report me for being unpatriotic. Oh no. <laughs> Anyways, um, but yeah. So that's what I'm getting right now so far with the story. Uh, I, I am happy that Calbix and Corwin are um, getting a little bit closer. Then uh, Calbix is allowing Corwin to 
um, well, not allowing, that, that he apologized for the way he's been behaving. And perhaps that means that he can appreciate having help. Because like he said, like, he didn't expect slash realize that he is basically um, somebody that needs help. He is not fully disabled, but you could say that he is disabled, like, in a way. Like, he has to have a prosthetic eye, and he had to have surgeries in order to fix him up. And while it is, well, he is able to walk around and do other things that others can't, th can't do, you know, that are less fortunate, um, he is still suffering from the fact that he, you know, that stuff happened to him. So he needs to accept the help from Corwin, and he needs to be able to properly, um, engage in that whole knight and squire relationship that he is supposed to be having with him, even if it means just accepting the help from Corwin. Helping him, I guess, bathe, maybe? Helping him do the laundry? Helping him just in the like the little things that, you know, that he might want to do because it's like, well, this used to be so easy in the past. Why can't I e do even this? So like, it's okay, dude. Like, this guy is here to help you with that. Um, anyways, I don't know. What else do you guys think? You know, write it down in the comments. And thank you all for watching slash listening. If you would like to play in finite space yourself, you can do so by going down into the link in the description. And it should have a um a direct link for the Infinite Space Infinite Space Twitter page. Uh, which should have a direct link for the HIO page. And you know, if you don't want to do it that that way, or if you don't have Twitter or you can't access Twitter or whatever, um, then you can just go to HIO and download it from there. Uh I would post a link for it, but furry visual novels. It's something that YouTube tolerates, but they don't tolerate the links where you can download it. Um, also, I will be posting down a link for their support thing. I think it's Patreon now. So if it's that, then I will be posting down a link along with every other little thing down in the description. So, you know, you know where to access it. So I guess that's it for now. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye bye.